My name is Dr. Olani Edwin Gwenya, and we continue with our um, plastic surgery podcast series. And in this series, we are um, speaking about breasts. And in breasts, as we've mentioned, we've gone through the anatomy, we've gone through the um, the development of the breast, and then we've gone into you know um, conditions that you may get with um, a breast, different conditions, and how we manage them. We, we also speak about different areas um, regarding enlarged breasts, um, how we then manage the large macromastia um, and gigantomastia. And then we also discuss different pathologies such as breast cancer and breast reconstructive surgery. And of course, lastly, gynecomastia. In this um, current talk, we will be discussing breast augmentation breast augmentation now this is a huge huge topic um and as i always mentioned it's just a brief overview just to give you um, a microscopic high level view um rather than getting into the the nitty gritties there's always so much in a topic um but here we try to just cover um and give you the brief um essentials um, that you need to have in your armamentorium in order to be able um, to 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 deal with um, such you know topics when you are faced with them specifically as a resident. Now let's speak about breast augmentation. I think just to give a brief outline of this, perhaps we will just give a a brief history about breast augmentation. Um, we speak about the indications, contraindications, how you evaluate a patient. A patient who comes says they want a breast augmentation. What are the steps that you should go through as a plastic surgeon? And what um, should you discuss when it comes to consent with the patient? And then let's just go into maybe speaking about implants, different types of implants that we get, and then operations, how we approach an operation for breast um, augmentation. So this will be the brief. Perhaps we can also just look at a few complications. The two main ones I would like us to focus on, capsular contracture, we discuss it and we discuss its management. And then just important, especially in this era, it's BIA, ALCL, breast um, implant, you know, associated um, large cell um, lymphoma, um, something that's quite topical, especially um, now where we find ourselves. So as you can see, it's a mammoth of a task, mammoth of a topic. And what we're going to do is just um, quickly go into it and then start. So, <clears throat> I mean, breast augmentation, as, as, as most of you may know, is something quite common. In fact, um, after liposuction, it is the second most common cosmetic surgery. Um, and and with the earliest, earliest reports that we have is as early as 1895, where you had Zeni, um, you know, Zeni performed the first breast augmentation with a lipoma, actually. And so, of course, as you know, with time, um, things started improving in the 1900s. There were multiple injectables that were used for augmentation. Um, Cronin um, and Giraud then came in in 1861, creating the first silicone implant, which is where we are. And this silicone implant was introduced in 1964 um, as a, a silicone envelope with this thick, thick, thick silicone, um, you know, liquid silicone within a Decron patch. Um, but we've gone and had our ups and downs with breast. Um, certainly, I mean, now we speak about BIALCL, um, but in the early, um, you know, um, 90s, um, 1992, um, the FDA actually placed a, memo a moratorium on silicone implants, um, specifically for primary breast augmentation. And the main concern therein was autoimmune and connective tissue disease. But of course, um, you and I probably know now that we had this this huge session where in 1991, you know, the, the NIH Institute of Medicine and National Academy of Science reviewed a whole lot of epidemiological studies and they actually were unable to detect any links between silicone 
and systemic autoimmune or prenatal disease. And eventually, we know that the moratorium was lifted in 2006 um, by the FDA after going through this, um, you know, quite lengthy process um, based on multiple meta-analysis, which proved the, 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 the you know, um, this not to be true. And so we, we, we've had this evolution of implants. In fact, currently now we've got, um, and something that you should know, um, if you're asked how many generations of silicone gel filled implants do you know of? And here we're speaking about silicone gel. We do know that there are saline implants, and that was introduced in the 1970s as an alternative to silicone. But you need to be able to tell me what was the first generation, second generation, third, fourth, and fifth generation implants, um, the silicone gel filled implants. And what were the problems they impact? Um, let's quickly go into it. I didn't want to, but uh, just to give you a brief overview. There was the first generation. That was in the 1960s. So in the 1960s, the production of the first generation implants that came in and the characteristics therein, it was a thick shell. On average, it was about 0.25 millimeters thick. That's how thick it was. And the, 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 the gel within was also thick and quite viscous with a Dacron patch. And of course, we had problems with these implants. And then in the 1970s, um, the same time that saline implants came, the second generation um, implants then came in. And the, 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 the aim here was to try to get something better. Um, and what, what was actually done is they had thin shells. So from the 0 0.25, it went to an average of 0 0.13 millimeters. The gel inside was also less viscous. And the Dacron patch, which was used, was no longer used. Now we had also other issues with those, rupture, etc. And so then the third generation then came in in the 1980s. Where, where are we going? We go back to thick. So we went back to the thick, um, you know, silica reinforced um, barrier coated shells. Um, so, um, and the gel also went back to a thick gel. And so those, we then had problems again, as you'd know, also with capsular contractures and, you know, these hard um, breast silicone implants. And so the fourth generation then kicked in in 1992. And mainly um, it was more refined. You know, we looked at um, stricter manufacturing standards that were looked at. And so the, 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 the shells um, became much thinner and the gel that was the focus which was high quality gels that we looked at and of course in 1993 the year after also um, the focus came in also more on the gels which we then started using cohesive silicone gel field devices um, you know uh, and, and, and when you look at the implants that we use in our present day Generally, you will find the fourth generation and the fifth generation implants are what you'd, you'd, you'd commonly find nowadays. So that takes care of the silicone implants. And now, when you, you then look at where and how far we've come, um, it's important then to, 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 to understand that it's not only um the, the 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 gel or the implant that became studied um or that we should consider alone but there's other areas which will enter into um that we should also consider when putting in a breast implant such as the pocket the incisions etc so there's been a lot of development not just on the implants but also on the technique therein now enough about that i think Maybe let's go into this. Here's a patient who then comes in um, and, and wants a breast augmentation. I think what you should know and what you should go back and have a look at is the normal anatomy. We've discussed it in one of our episodes. And, 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 and what defines a perfect breast? 
Of course, there were numbers that were put in um, by Penn. Um, Malucci and Brentford in the PRS 2014 actually, you know, go further and describe and say, what is an aesthetically pleasing breast, you know? Um, what is the upper pole and the lower pole ratio, um, you know, 45 upper pole, lower pole, 55%. Um, you know, they say an upward pointing nipple about 20 degrees of a mean, a mean angle, you know, a, a, a straight or mildly concave upper pole slope a smooth lower pole concavity but there are many different definitions and just go have a look um, and try to understand um, you know what is the normal so that you know when you now want to fix um, this this patient and insert this implant what are you aiming to achieve and that is the importance. And as I always say, if you don't know the normal, if you don't know the 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 the, the, the goals, then you cannot operate because you are just shooting without any target. Um, and that's how you end up with disaster. Another thing to know, I think, would be the indications. And generally, we know what the indications are. I mean, it mostly it would be to enhance, you know, breast shape and volume. Um, also to improve one's body image, you know, their symmetry, the balance. Um, also about clothing. Um, we, we've seen when we discussed high uh, macromastia, um, how patients had issues with clothes, but also patients with smaller breasts. Um, they have issues with clothes. They've got psychological issues. They want to have the appearance um, of, you know, this breast lift, this increase in cleavage. Um, and, and generally, um, you may have even patients who come in postpartum um, after the, 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 the involution, the breasts are deflated. They would come in for rejuvenation. And these are the general indications of breast augmentation. There are contraindications. Um, you should be aware of some absolute, some, you know, um, uh, uh, relative contraindications. But I would just say, you know, um, just a couple of groups, maybe you should just, um, you know, keep uh, a, some level of reservation um, before you do it. As you should think about these, you know, patients with um, psychological instability. It's important. To go through refer to a psychiatrist let the patient be evaluated you also have patients with body dysmorphic disorders um and this you know is certainly a contraindication um and you know just you you don't want a patient who comes in merely because they are also responding to peer spousal or parental you know pressure because I generally, in, 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 in my experience, um, you know, we found that you are going to have issues when people are doing it for, for other reasons. Um, so just things, I'm just giving you guidelines, but you need to, you know, of course, um, assess your patient. Um, you know, people who are trying to, to salvage a marriage or a relationship or to find a husband. These are red flags that you think you should think of. Other, um, you know, books will tell you patients who are less than 18 years of age, um, patients who have significant breast disease, such as severe um, fibrocystic disease, you know, ductal hyperplasia, high risk breast cancer. These, you know, are some that are stated as contraindications, including collagen vascular disease. So um, I'm just giving you things that should give you red flags um, and then you will assess as a specialist and be able to then um, treat your patient accordingly. But just keep those, um, that group of patients in mind um, and then proceed with caution. Okay, so let's now evaluate this patient here's a patient she's come into the rooms and she sits in front of you and then asks you um about this so what are you going to go through on history of course you are going to look at those issues we spoke about um and then other general history issues you know personal history family history breast cancer history remember breast cancer you must look for risk factors and family history Ask about the pregnancy history, you know, what was the breast size before? What was it during and after 
um, pregnancy and what are her plans for future children. And mammogram, as I've mentioned, very important, especially, you know, um, for patients aged 35 and above if you are planning to operate on the breast and then just find out what are the patient's goals, you know, what's the current breast size and what's the future desired breast size. Those are important because you want to take the patient into, you know, confidence and give the patient a result that which will be pleasing to them. And, and then the examination is something that is very important. I think um, there was an article, there's many articles. I mean, there's one that I liked in the CME, CME in 2014, um, which looked at um, different areas, um, such as the height and the weight of the patient. Um, you know, he looked at he, the skin quality. is very important to look at skin quality. Look um, at the tone, elasticity. Is the stria there? Um, look for asymmetries that may exist, um, not just on the, the you know, the, the, the breast itself, but the chest wall, scoliosis. You want to have a look at this. Um, you want to do your measurements as we've spoken about, you know, looking at the, the IMF height, um, the difference in the NAC height. These are important measurements you want to look at. Look at ptosis and be able as per regno to, to, to diagnose um, and classify the, the ptosis because mild ptosis is generally improved by augmentation. But once you have quite moderate to severe Tosis, these patients are likely to require um, a mysteropexy um, with the augmentation. And of course, that's something also to, to approach cautiously if you're going to do an augment mystopexy as you have, you know, um, forces that are that are counter each other. But generally, there's people who do it and there's people who would say, nope, you, it's not wise to do a, you know, a, a mystopexy with an augmentation in the same setting. But you just read and know the pros and the cons. Very important. Measurements that I'm going to give you, I need you to know this. And in fact, if you look at um, Tebet, um, the Tebet high five system of things to look at. And Tebet says, look, you want to do a pinch test in the superior pole and the inferior pole. In the superior pole, must be more than two centimeters. Of course, this is when you are trying to consider what? A subglandular, um, you know, plane to use. Um, also, you want to look at the inferior um, pole, um, where if it's less than five millimeters, it, you know, um, it, it may be problematic um, and some consideration may be given to rather not dividing the inferior pectoralis um, origin. So we'll talk about this when we talk about the different planes. Um, the breast base, very important to measure. You want to do a, a skin stretch test. Um, and generally, the, 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 the accepted criteria, you, you know, you know if you can um, a measurement, anything measure, measured between two to three centimeters is relatively normal. But if it's the skin stretch test is less than two centimeters, it's quite tight. And if it's, you know, three to four centimeters, very loose. Measurements greater than four, ooh, these, you know, indicates a relative degree um, of laxity. Um, and it may be, it may not be so compatible, you know, with breast augmentation alone without a skin tightening procedure. So you'd need to consider those. And of course, the last um, would be the nipple to the IMF on stretch. Um, and, 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 and these are some of the things. So Tibet, um, the, the five critical decisions in breast augmentation planning, soft tissue coverage, implant size and weight, implant type, shape and dimensions, IMF position and incision location. And these are some of the things we'll be going into. But generally, when you assess a patient, those are the measurements that you will want to take. Um, you know, the, the heights, the body frame, sternal to nipple notch, nipple to IMF, the skin stretch, the upper pole and the inferior pole um, pinch test that you want to do. And then, of course, um, because they tell you about parenchymal coverage and then the base width will be very important um, and the stretch we've already mentioned. It. So those are the main um, type of things you'd like to have. But just go have a look at those. There's usually a sheet 
that um, would cover all of that. And you can then just look and make sure in your evaluation, those measurements are there. You must have those measurements. So now that we've done with evaluating the patient, let's go into the procedure. So how do we then operate and what options do we have? So we can divide this into, um, you know, or maybe before we go that, let's look at our implants. How, how do you choose an implant? That's the next thing because the patient will then want to know, okay, which implants must I take? You've evaluated me. And so you will look at, of course, volume. Volume is a big thing. Um, and volume is, is driven generally by, you know, your measurements that you've done. Also, the patient's preference, very important. Um, and so you don't want to, to, to go um, on, you know, and have a large, um, you, know, you know, CCs using um, when your measurements, um, you know, your analysis as per the high five system do not correlate. So you must be cautious. So there is patient's preference. But that also is limited by your measurements and also your, your experience as a surgeon because you know in order to go by one cup um, higher, generally that would be 120 to 150 mils um, required to increase by one cup size. So, and of course, it depends on the frame of the patient because the larger the frame, of course, they may require larger implants just to increase the cup size. So there are various um, technical elements they're in. So that takes care of the volume. So you would measure all of those and then you discuss the patient as per the volume that you'd use. Um, there are sizes that you will also use in theater um, to be able to assist you and guide you um, before you then open the proper implant to then put it in. Now, the next thing would be the, the filler. It's important that we discuss the filler types, especially now. Um, so the options that you have are saline implants um, or you can go for silicone fillers. Silicone fillers, we generally use them. I use them a lot. Um, and the advantage is, look, they give you that more of a natural feel. Um, I find rather than the saline. However, the disadvantages and as documented um, in relative um, studies is that they, they, they may have problems, you know, in terms of adjusting um, to, to temperature, to body core temperature. Example, when you go in and swimming, um, another issue is that, you know, with saline, um, when it's ruptures, it can get easily absorbed. But with these ruptures may actually cause a local, you know, inflammatory response and granulomas that may then form. Um, but these are, you know, are certainly good. I mean, a lot of work, as I've explained with the generations going in, that these have improved with time. Um, and, you know, the, 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 the cohesive gels that we are now using, looking at silicone, which is this polymer, um, you know, it's, it, it, they, they really, 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 really becoming um, quite good um, and relatively safe. And we know as per our, um, you know, previous FDA concerns that really those were not proven with the autoimmune. The saline um, implants advantages, they adjust quickly to body core temperature. You know, the leaks, as I've mentioned, are safely absorbed by the body. They are generally easy to adjust, you know, for size and correct breast asymmetry. But there is wrinkling that you commonly find with it, you know. Um, and when they leak, <laughs> they're going to lead to that complete deflation. And so those are some of the concerns that the feel may not be as natural as the silicone. Um, but depending on what you, you know, the, the procedure that you are going to do, um, trans, trans umbilical, um, trans auxiliary, as we'll go into, it may di dictate the type of implant to use because in some of these, unfortunately, you may not be able to use a silicone implant. So that's the filler. The next thing to look at will be the shell in itself. This is the outer covering. And the big, big, big things, I guess we can divide it into three main groups. 
there's the smooth implants, there's the textured implants, and of course, within texture, there's micro texture, etc. So then there's the the other group which he really um also had um there was a lot of controversy regarding it. They are available, your polyurethane um you know covered implants and and these also quite exist nowadays and we'll go into them as well so generally textured smooth and polyurethane covered implants would be the groups that you look at when we then speak about the shell now perhaps let's start with the 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 the, the smooth implants they you know they are a thinner capsule of course when you have you're gonna have a capsular contracture um with them um and that's what we found you know um generally the advantages they are said to have a thinner capsule um they are, are, are said to be less palpable you know and actually preferable for patients with thin coverage but the disadvantages is there is um, a slightly higher contracture rate with them, especially this we're speaking about the subclandular pocket, of course. That's, you know, we found that the, 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 the contracture rates are much greater, especially there. Now, the textured implants, which currently now um, there's a whole lot of controversy, um, are, are, are implants that we've used for a whole, you know, long time. In fact, the FDA now um has 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 given it a thumbs up with caution. Um, and the advantages um which are now challenged by others were the lower rates of contracture when put in the subclandular plane. You know, um, there are, there's a couple of articles, but if you look arguments that are put now is that no 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 you know we we knew that due to the micropore surface um it disorientates collagen deposition and thus it minimizes these vector forces for that contractile effect to then form in that subclandular plane um but others then say look submuscular pocket um placement you know, it, it likely actually equilibrates, you know, um, what can I say? It, it equilibrates the contracture risk between smooth and textured. So it's not such a biggie. Um, you know, the proponents will say there's less migration because that's the whole point in the textures. And also there's less implant rotation that you then get. However, we know the shells are thicker. It may be more palpable, you know, there's traction rippling that you will get. And now, um, as we have it, it's been discontinued um, due to concerns over the BIALCL, which we'll speak about, especially from the elegant, the bio cell, um, specifically a lot also um, cases coming from then. So, so that's something we'll speak about. And further, there are new claims that, you know, the benefit that we thought that there was no capsular contracture is that actually, no, you do get, um, you know, a contracture. However, the new claim says um, there's formation instead of a double capsules that you will then have, you know. So these are just some of the things I need you to just go have a look at um, regarding those um, what are the pros, what are the cons, but the big thing is the BIACL, and then there are the, you know, studies that have found the formation of double capsules. Um, and the, um, perhaps what we can then go into, um, I'm not going into anatomical or teardrop shape because all those ones are the textured, um, and how you position them, but perhaps we can just speak about the polyurethane, you know, because as you can see, the main thing we've been um, trying to address with these, um, it's rotation, migration, but capsular contracture being the greatest thing. And so the polyurethane came, you know, um, and what was found, it had really dramatically low contracture rates, less than 1% over 10 years. And so that's the main advantage. Um, it was pulled out, you know, from the U.S. market because of, um, you know, polyurethane breaks down as a carcinogenic, a carcinogenic compound. 
Um, although, you know, it was known the, the levels are likely insignificant, but they are now available um, and, and you can just go into those um, as to, you know, what happens. Basically, the polyurethane coating actually separates over weeks to months and becomes more incorporated into the capsule. So this actually is what helps to disperse the contractile forces. But just note that the, 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 the textured implants were actually, you know, developed to mimic the effects of polyurethane um, implants, covered implants on the capsule, um, which, disper which also are there, as I've explained, to assist with dispersing the contractile forces. So now that we know about the filler, the surface, we, we of course, um, would look at the dimensions and the shape. We have generally either round implants or we have anatomical implants. Anatomical implants, you know, um, the height is different from the width. Maybe you can think of that. And the round is just a circular implant. The anatomical, you know, we they are designed to give a more natural breast shape, you know. Um, the, the increase... Um, use they in um we, we we generally also use them in reconstructive surgery um but the disadvantages of course one must make sure you know um putting it in um you may find it challenging as a beginner because you must make sure that it must be oriented properly and it must be symmetrical as compared to a round implant where the difficulty is not really there um and you know most being a textured implant, they maintain their position. Um, so just have a look at those, play around with some implants, but generally the upper pole is tapered and it's fuller on the lower pole, reducing the upper pole, um, you know, it collapse and filling the lower pole with, with the breast, giving it that natural feel. But generally, most patients who come for breast augmentation, um, you know what has been used and what most patients would require are your round implants. And those, um, you would then uh, classify them um, depending on their uh, profile. Um, you know, from low profile, moderate profile, moderate plus profile, or high profile, where you've got basically increased projection for a given base width at each level of projection. So um, with a high profile, you've got increased volume for a given base width, and that's simply what it is. And um, we generally use, um, and in my practice, high profile implants um, certainly have served um, me well. So these are the, 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 the considerations um, that you discuss with the patient when choosing an implant, the shell, the filler, um, you know, the shape of the implant, very important in this. So now we're going into the operation. Let's operate on the patient. Now, before you operate, now you've got to also discuss um, and, and, and speak about certain things. And the things I'd like you to touch on is the incision. Very important to know the type of incisions that we have. The implant pockets, the pockets that you will then use, is the next important thing that we must look at. So, and then others would say the IMF position, um, I would say, look, let's stick to those two, the incision and the pocket. Um, generally, for me, those will be enough um, factors to have a look at and certainly in your exam to then mention. Um, and in this, I'm not going to go into the, the ADM, but just know when and what ADM can be used for. Let's speak about incision. So what are my options for incision? How can I insert this, um, this, this, this implant? And I'm not speaking laparoscopically because those have been certainly attempted. I'm speaking about the different incision in the areas where we can make. So generally, most commonly two incisions um, would be the IMF and the perioricular. So the inframemory fold, um, great place to put an incision. Um, the perioreolar region, another good area. Many plastic surgeons do it. Um, and then the others 
at times exhilarating. Um, you know, generally, I mean, it's been a blind procedure in the early 70s, but now there has been um, advances, you know, endoscopically that are used. And I know a surgeon um, generally in my area who still does it. Um, and and you need quite a special retractor to be able to look and look and be able to, to you know, divide the plane and do it. But um, uh, really an option that's there. The trans umbilical procedure is another one that's been described um, and that's received a whole lot of um, you know interest in the in the past few years um, with this development because it's an area where the scar can be hidden you know and quite distant from the breast um, but we'll go into it because there are some issues related to that. But IMF periauricular, I mean peri areola, generally the ones that are used more common. And the IMF, the advantages um, is when the patient is standing, especially with, you know, mild ptosis um, or a well-defined IMF, the scar generally is well hidden. Um, you know, the um, it, it, you've got actually control. I think it's the best position, you know, where you've got control of actually developing a good pocket because you've got good access. You can also avoid contact with, you know, the breast ducts, um, which generally you would, as you would, you would imagine are colonized, um, you know, by bacteria predominantly around the, the areola complex. Um, but generally, those would be our causes, as you'd see when we speak about um, capsular contracture. So this is an advantage of that. However, the scar, if not if it's not planned properly, it can be um, visible. I'm not going to go into the technical, um, you know, aspects of how you will place the incision, how long it will be, um, commonly five centimeters or less, or where you put you. Those are things that you can have a look at that. And then the periareola, you know where that incision is usually. You can get good access. It's well hidden, especially in a patient who heals well. It does not heal by hypertrophic scarring. So in a certain Fitzpatrick good population, um, it may work well. Um, and there's no decreased nipple sensation, you know, um, compared with the IMF technique. However, um, the, 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 the issue is it may transverse um, and the scar, you know, may be prone um, to, there may be bacteria around there is some of the, 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 the disadvantages or, or, or what's stated um, as the problems that may be there and the hypertrophic scarring. So the contamination theory is that which will carry in this, um, especially going into capsular contracture from ductal bacteria. So, but it's something that's used. Remember, I'm giving you pros and cons. Um, and then clinically, when implemented, many people use it with success. But I'm giving you the general approach so you know academically and you may be able to hold a sound um, argument. Trans auxiliary, I've gone into those. Um, there's no scar on the breast. And generally, you know, the scar, though, I must say, may be visible when, you know, a patient wears sleeveless and raises their arms. Um, and you might have difficulty actually as you insert, you know, especially silicone implants. Trans umbilical, not going to go into it. It may be dangerous. If you don't know what you're doing, stay away from it. But it's been something that's described. The sky is hidden, um, but it's blind. It's difficult um, if you are going to attempt it for the first time. And you may have, you know, high or asymmetrical placement, you know, um, and then now when you want to make adjustments and corrections, you may find it quite difficult. And of course, as you can imagine, you're not going to be able to put in a sailor, I mean, a, a silicone implant there. Um, and so you are already restricted to saline implants. But certainly um, something that's received much talk, um, including the endoscopic insertion. Um, those are some of the things you can have a look at. But that's as per incision. Now, you must then choose your pocket. And generally, there are five pockets that you can put. It's either a subglandular, which is between the, the, the breast um, and the, the pec um, fascia, the pec major. 
Then it can be subfascial, which is between the pectoralis fascia and the pectoralis muscle itself. And I'm going to say stay away. And then it can be subpectoral, which is behind the pectoralis. And when we speak of subpectoral plane, we then speak about um, dual plane, um, or it can then be also um, a dual plane. I mean, you know, there is a controlled amount um, of pectoralis muscle that covers the implants and then this glandular tissue that will cover the rest. And then it can be totally submuscular, meaning behind the pectoralis um, and serratus anterior muscle. And these are just some of it. So what are the pros? Subglandular, definitely great. Good projection shape. It prevents distortion, um, you know, of the muscles um, in, in patients who are quite active. But as, as has been said, especially with smooth implants, that there's a higher contracture rate. And, you know, the, the edges of the implants may be palpable. And there's been talks that it may interfere with mammography, but we know now, I mean, you'll be able with good, um, well-trained sonographers um, and radiologists, they can pick this up, you know. Contraindications, of course, we've spoken about it, a skin pinch, um, parenchymal um, test in the upper pole, less than two millimeters, already gives you that indication. Um, and the technique, generally not so difficult you dissect on top of the pectoralis major below the gland subfascial i'm not going to talk in you know about it because it's been it's not been widely adopted um because of the results they've not been so satisfactory and we don't have long-term data um so i'm not going to go into that but just to know about it being an option there's the subpectoral plane which, you know, is something that is used quite common. And most of the implants you will see nowadays, depending where you are, of course, it will be a subpectoral plane. Um, and the advantages, as we've mentioned, the lower contracture rates, the, 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 the thick, soft tissue coverage that you have. And so really, you know, you're not really going to be able to palpate the implant. You've got good preservation of um, nipple sensation and a better feel. However, the disadvantages, of course, you may have a dancing breast <laughs> during um, contraction of the pectoralis major where you have this uh, animation deformity, as we call it, and you may have lateral displacement um, of this implant over time. And it's actually quite difficult with this to control the upper pole. But of course, um, you know, if you do something regularly, um, you generally get good results um, and can tweak certain things. But the relative contraindication, muscular um, or an active um, patient, um, because you, you generally don't want to put it there. Um, the dissection techniques, I think you can then go into those. Now, then there's a biplanar um, where it can, you know, you have a dual plane and that we divide into two. So into three, there's dual plane one, dual plane two, and dual plane three. Dual plane one, what are we saying? We say that with dual plane one, the pectoralis is released along the IMF in addition to subpectoral dissection. So in this, there's no retro memory dissection. We just release the pec along the IMF. That's all. Dual plane two, which is what generally I do, um, is, is in addition to releasing it from the IMF and, and, and the subpectoral dissection, the pectoralis is also separated from the breast can parenchyma to the level up to the nipple areola complex and not any higher. The minute you go higher and you continue to a level superior to the NAC, that makes it a dual plane three. Dual plane one along the IMF, two, you then do a subparenchymal um, dissection to the level of NAC. 
and then three higher than the NAC. And this has given quite great results. You know, advantages, um, you have the subpectoral coverage of the upper pole, which makes it so great. Um, you've got a thick soft coverage. The contracture rates um, have found to be lower. There's, you know, less implants, displacement at rest, even when the patient now contracts the pectoralis muscle as we used to get um, with the animation um, deformity that you get. So it, it's great because even the IMF or rather the implant can be can rest nicely and be positioned along the IMF. Um, and, and, and you get good interface between the implant and the parenchyma. So um, this makes it great because it lowers um, and prevents this double bubble deformity that we used to get, um, double bubble water flow where the, the implant is right up there and um, the breast in time has set lower down. But disadvantages, you know, usually restricted to IMF incision. And when it's performed, um, you know, when you do a duplane one and two, you must then limit your, 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 your it, it, it dictates your incision already. Um, and already remember, we spoke about our assessment. If you, our IMF pinch test is less than 0.5 um, centimeters, um, then here you rather require a complete retromuscular pocket placement and not to di divide the, the inferior insertions of the muscles. Total submuscular, um, more frequently, you know, a reconstructive technique, um, less commonly done for augmentation. You know, it's it may, you know, the dissection quite painful, may be bloody. There's a tendency for the device to rise to the superior um, pole. And, 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 you know, the results, um, you know, sometimes there's difficulty in predicting, um, you know, creating a deep and well-formed IMF. So um, generally, uh, I don't like and we seldom would use it in augmentation. So those are your consideration. We've spoken about our, in our implants. We've spoken about our pockets um, or the operation where we, our incision and then the pockets that we'll then use. I think... In, 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 for, for these last few minutes, perhaps we can speak about the complication as we close it. Um, and the complications, we know I'm not going to go extensively into them. I mean, that's a huge topic on its own, but capsular contracture. Capsular contracture is a big one. What you must know about capsular contracture would be the etiology of capsular contracture, and those generally are two. There's the infectious hypothesis, which says, look, there's a subclinical infection. Um, and, and with this, it, 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 it then forms, as Per Fidel and his colleagues, a biofilm. And this is what then is going to cause that. And, and, and this correlates quite well, um, because if you look at the, um, the, 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 the studies that have been done, you know, we've seen that actually when you look at the capsule, um, you know, we did actually culture, um, you know, some strep, um, estef, estef epididymis, which was most commonly cultured, therefore suggesting this theory, the infectious hypothesis. There's also the hypertrophic scar or rather inflammatory process hypothesis um, as is supported by what we've also found in the specimen, such as talc and operating towels and fibers that have been found within the histological studies of capsules. So this is actually um, suggesting a foreign body reaction um, as a possible cause for capsular contracture. So now that we know about it, it's important for you to be able to classify it. And the classification that we use is the Baker classification system. Baker's 1 to Baker's 4. Baker's 1 says the, the, the breast is normal. So there's normal, soft, it's, you know, the implant cannot be palpable. Then Baker's 2 will then say it's actually palpable, but it's not visible. In other words, the implant, um, you can now palpate this capsular contracture. However, visually, 
there's minimal you know it's it, it's it, it, you cannot see any visible distortions baker 3 then says uh uh you can now palpate but you can also now see so it's visible it's easily palpated and moderately quite firm and then the last part which is baker 5 adds pain says it's visible it's palpable it's hard there is this breast distortion but it's also painful the patient complains of pain baker one normal baker two palpable not visible baker three palpable and visible baker four palpable visible and painful i'm just giving you know an easy overview so you can understand that all right so what then can we do to prevent a capsular contracture? So the way we can prevent it, there are strategies to prevent it. Um, I like to use the Hudson's 10 principles for prevention of a biofilm that was published in 2013. That helps to assist. And basically what you'd like to do um, as, as, as surgical strategies, you, you, you number one, want to exclude and manage any biofilm related infections. You, you want to give a patient prophylactic antibiotics before you start the procedure. You want to avoid incision around contaminated areas. Um, and so you may want to put shields around the nipples. You want to maintain careful surgical dissection principles. So these are atraumatic procedures. And you want to clearly irrigate your pocket with antimicrobial agents, for example, triple antibiotics or betadine. And this is as per Hudson's um, 10 principles. You want to use new instruments. So after now, once we open the implants, we want to use new instruments, we want to change our gloves, and we want a no-touch procedure so that we don't want to, to have any of our um, you know, e e e implants, any part of the implants touching the body. Um, and we want to minimize our operating time and avoid unnecessary contact with the implants. Of course, when we close, we want to have at least a two-layered closure. Um, we want to also consider the use of drains because where possible, you want to limit this. And then, of course, products such as antibiotic um, coatings um, may be used post-operatively so these are just some of the things to assist you when um you know doing a or inserting a breast augmentation um to minimize the rate of capsular contracture but now that we have capsular contracture we could not prevent it how do we then manage the way we manage it i'm not going to go too much into pharmacological um, where, of course, they would speak about antibiotics um, that you would use, corticosteroids, um, cyclosporin A, vitamin E, COX-2 inhibitors, you know, even things about um, leukotriene inhibitors and implant massage. But as surgeons, um, in conjunction with some of these, what we then need to do for the patient who's got a Baker 3 or 4, we want to do a capsulectomy. And the indications for a capsulectomy, as I've mentioned, is a Baker's 3 or a Baker's 4. A calcified or thick capsule, ruptured, um, silicone granulomas, infection, um, all of that, you know, when we need a new plane, we are going to do a, a capsulectomy. And this, we have found to have lower contracture recurrence rate. And whatever contamination was there, we have removed it. Of course, hemostasis may be difficult, you know, anteriorly, especially if it's subglandular, the skin may be compromised. Posteriorly, if it's subpectoral, you generally have problems with that um, lower, um, you know, area that's tightly adhered to the chest and there's a risk of a pneumothorax. But if done well, it can be great. Um, I'm not going to speak about ADM. ADM has been spoken a lot about that there are lower contracture rates when we then use this um, acellular dermal matrix. However, um, the rates of seromas are higher, um, but I'll leave you to read about, you know, ADM used as a pectoral expander or um, just in the lower pole or around the entire implant. Other options are capsulectomies. 
So what are you doing? It's either opened or closed, closed capsulotomy, manual external pressure um, that's given in an attempt to break. Please, not recommended. There's a risk of rupture and bleeding. Open capsulectomy, that's, you know, when you go in and you score um, your, your capsule, but just know the rate of recurrence much higher, 37 to 89% that's been mentioned. And so this um, does not create a really new environment. And we've spoken about, you know, other pharmacological treatments, and then you can look at those, but they really need a large prospective randomized trials in order to prove some of them. And these are now your options for management. But we know before we manage these patients, you want to then, you know, diagnose. How are you going to diagnose? The easiest thing, it's history, it's examination, and then investigations. And two investigations that come ranking much higher is actually an ultrasound. Ultrasound has moderate sensitivity and specificity, and you are able to see with an experienced sonographer looking for, you know, dispersion of sonographic beams. That's how, that's what we know as the snowstorm sign. Um, and also looking for a step ladder sign, which are multiple parallel echogenic lines with, um, within this implant interior. And these also indicate to you intracapsular um, you know, ruptures that are there. And MRI, excellent, highly sensitive. In fact, it's the highest sensitivity, more than 90% um, for detecting silicone rupture, um, you know, and specificity also high. It can detect both intra and extracapsular rupture. And the advantage, there's no exposure to radiation. But it is expensive, the cost is quite high, and patients who have pacemakers, you know, aneurysm clips, foreign bodies, etc., you won't be able to undertake this. But what are we looking for? Two classic signs that are mentioned. The linguine sign, which is a sine qua non for intracapsular rupture. Um, it looks like, you know, you have these linguines, the spaghetti or the a, around your the, 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 the capsule. And then there's a tear drop sign, um, which, you know, you would see that the silicone within a radial fold and also outside the, the, the implant lumen in itself. And these are indications. Extracapsular leak, easy to also see. CT scan you may use, um, but it's an alternative modality actually to an MRI. So that handles our complications of... Um, breast implants of note the worst complication that we don't want and the most feared is implant extrusion patient comes in and then this implant has extruded um i think the best thing and then you try you want to close the best thing maybe take it out let it rest a bit and then you need to encourage the patient tell them that look in three to six months we'll then keep in i suggest keeping the other implant on there's no indication to remove it um and then after after that time, then you can go in and um, remove and, and then reinsert the implant. Now this, as I told you, has been a lengthy talk. Perhaps last but not least, let's touch on BIACL because it's something very important. This is a rare T-cell lymphoma. It's not breast cancer. It's a T-cell lymphoma, non-Hodgkin um, type of lymphoma, typically occurring um, you know, in a delayed fluid collection around a textured implant, or, or it may actually surround the capsular scar. And this has been formally recognized by the World Health Organization in 2016, and you would see there are updates um, that we are now going by by the 2019. What I like to use, um, the NCC and guidelines, um, which were revised also in September 2020, um, they, they give a good way of dealing with it. The incident known to be um, from as early as, you know, before breast augmentation um, and the textured implants, it was one in three million and now it's one in 200,000. So this is quite significant, even though very, very rare, about a million cases worldwide. Um, it's still something, you know, relevant and quite significant that you must discuss with the patient. So they must be aware. 
And what are the general clinical presentation? Most commonly, you know, it's a spontaneous peri-prosthetic fluid collection. And those are about two-thirds of patients that will present like that. And then a third will present with a capsular mass. And generally, it's about eight to ten years after an implant has been inserted. So eight to ten years, a long period. Other symptoms may be breast enlargement, a skin rash, capsular contracture, lymphadenopathy, but two-thirds of the patient um, will present in the manner that we've spoken of with this periprosthetic fluid collection. And the way you diagnose it simply, evaluate and do a sonar. You then pick this up. The sonar will evaluate and show you fluid collection. It will show you if there are any masses of which you'll biopsy if there's a mass as well as any enlarged lymph node, whether axillary, subclavicular, internal memory, you should be able to pick up. And quite sensitive for detecting, you know, effusion. About 84%, that's how sensitive. And a mass, anything from 40 to 100% um, sensitive in det detecting that, um, which is actually found to be similar, if not better than CT scan or MRI. But a CT scan or an MRI, if the ultrasound is you know, indeterminate, you may need it um, for further confirmation. So after the sonar, I see this periprosthetic fluid collection. What am I going to do? As per the NCCN guidelines, you take a fine needle aspirate of that fluid. How much do you want? 50 mils. I was going to say anything between 25 to 50 mils. But if you can get 50 mils, great. We send that for cytology. We send it also for immunohistochemistry. And the big thing we are searching for is CD30. If it comes back CD30, we are worried. And we look, we also send and do a flow cytometry for T cell markers if they are increased. So what is the criteria for diagnosis of breast implants associated anaplastic large cell lymphoma? What is it? Therefore, first, it's, it's the tumor, the clinically, the tumor with adequate pathological specimen for analysis, which involves an effusion, as we've mentioned, or a mass. Two, it's um, a neoplasm with large lymphoid cells and abundant cytop cytoplasmic and pleomorphic nuclei. And three, CD30 positivity. So there must be uniform expression of CD30 when you do your immunohistochemistry. And in fact, a single at least clonal expanded T cell population when you do flow cytometry. And the last but not least, you're going to look for ALK, which is anaplastic lymphoma kinase. And it must be negative for that protein. Or if you have translocation, involving the ALK gene on chromosome 2, Q23, it must be negative for that. So if I've got fluid, it's CD30 positive, it's ALK negative, that is um, BIALCL. And immediately after I've diagnosed that, I then want to do my lymphoma work up. And how do I do that? I take blood for a full blood count and a differential. I do an ALDH and I do a hepatitis B screen. B, bone marrow aspirate in selected cases. If, if only you suspect systemic spread, then you do it. And then a PET scan, generally, you know, um, if, 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 if there's involvement suspected um, systemically, we are going to do that. There is a staging system that is done. Um, generally, you know, the T1 to T4, meaning T1, if it's confined to, you know, the effusion or a layer on the luminal side of the capsule, T2 is now this early invasion of the capsule. T3, there's large aggregate infiltration of the capsule. And then T4, it definitely infiltrates beyond the capsule. So you may stage it using that. But what we are concerned about is the treatment. We've assessed, we've evaluated that patient, we've worked up that patient. And then now, what does the NCC, what do the NCCN guidelines say as per our management? The management is going to be a capsulectomy. Are we doing a modified radical mastectomy for the patient? No, just a surgical total capsulectomy with removal of the breast implant 
is sufficient. And if there's any mess, you will excise any associated capsular mess or excise any, um, you know, e e e e e suspicious lymph node. Excisional biopsy would say is something that must be done. So modified radical mastectomy is not indicated. Capsulectomy, explantation will suffice for these patients. And then you speak to your radiologist and then um, a radiation oncologist um, and medical oncologist to refer this patient for systemic therapy. And generally CHOP, C-H-O-P, um, is what will be used um, as, as the, the regimen for that. There's also the da epoch which can be used, D-A-E-P-O-C-H, but CHOP in our institution is what to then use. Follow up this patient. You want to make sure you do a follow up every three to six months for two years. And then as indicated, you will do a CT scan and a PET as indicated, you know, six months for two years. Um, and then after you'll follow as indicated. And that is our management of a um, BIA, ALCL. So we've spoken about breast augmentation. We've gone through the implants, everything. We've gone through capsular contracture. We've gone through BIACL. I trust with this, you will at least have, you know, be equipped to manage any, any question that comes your way regarding breast augmentation. I thank you for your attention. Till next time. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye.